You want to start? No. <laughs> Every time. I like the way you start. Hello and welcome to the Sub Pop Podcast. I am Arwen Nix here with Alyssa Atkins. Hello, I'm here. Hey, how's it going? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty well, good. Pretty yeah. good is pretty good. What are we um, talking about on a Sub Pop Podcast today? Today is a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Today we're going to talk about Carissa's Weird. A personal favorite band of mine and yours. <laughs> yes, it's true. Can you tell the story of Chris is Weird in Chris two is, sentences? Oh, no, <laughs> no, I can't. But I can tell it in a few more than that. Um, okay. Chris is Weird is a band that formed in Tucson originally in the late 90s. And the co-founders were Matt Brooke and Jen Champion. And then Ben Bridwell joined up. Chris is Weird formed like a bit of a cult following in the late 90s, early 2000s. And they... They toured for a few years and the people who loved them really intensely loved them. And then they broke up and people went, their fans went kind of crazy. And like <laughs> their CDs, you could barely get them anywhere. And like if you looked on eBay in like 2004, a Carissa's Weird CD was going for like $300. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so you mentioned that it was Ben Bridwell and Matt Brooke, and then also Sarah Cahoon, who was in that band. Yeah, she was one of the many drummers. Yeah, and those are all artists that went on to be in bands that Sub Pop has continued to work with mm -hmm. as well. So our connection to Chris is Weird sort of formed, er, like, right after they broke up, maybe? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, Band of Horses got signed to Sub Pop, and Band of Horses started because Chris is Weird broke up. Right. And then Grand Archives and Sarah Cahoon's solo career. Yeah. Yes. So it all goes from there. And it all does come back to this band, Chris is Weird. And Chris is Weird, their catalog, essentially, most of their catalog was then put out in the early days of Hardly Art. Right, yeah. Nick Heliotis and Sarah Moody decided to put out all these things, records that had never been released on vinyl, and were then available digitally because... They were big fans of the music and they could see the demand for it. Because again, $300 on eBay for a Chris's Weird CD. Beloved. Wild. <laughs> that is crazy. Yeah, no, it really is. It's a lot of money. Um, so that's what the episode is today is an interview with Jen Champion about why Carissa's Weird ended. And when it first started, when we first started talking about the idea of bands ending, like breaking up, mm -hmm. Um, I remember us talking about, you know, what if we just talked to people about the moment they knew that they were done in their band? Yeah. What was the moment they knew it was over? And Jen and Chris is Weird was for sure on the list, but mm -hmm. we had a few other people on the list. And what happened when you talked with people about, tell me about why you quit your band? Well, Alyssa, <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of people got mad. And not at me, but I, there's just so many intense feelings around a lot of bands mm -hmm. breaking up. And mm -hmm. there is like, this is like, you're asking me about my divorce or you're asking me about the worst time in my life or you're asking me to tell like essentially like the secrets of my family. Right. Because you have these really intimate relationships. And there were uh, there were people who were totally willing to go on the record with me in a more shallow way mm -hmm. and be like, yeah, we broke up. I mean, it was kind of like this day at practice or we just weren't getting along anymore or whatever. But most people didn't really want to get into it because people are sensitive to the feelings of the other band members and they want to make sure that they're not kind of telling someone else's secrets. Right. Or their story to tell, even though the intention never was to be tell the whole story of it. It's just so heavy and layered. Yeah. That was the thing that I think really struck me is how layered a lot of these decisions really end up being. It's not any one thing. It's a whole bunch of reasons. Yeah. No matter how clear I was with my intentions saying like, no, I just want your singular perspective on what happened. I don't want you to speak for anyone else in the band. People were still kind of touchy about it. Well, and I think it shows how interconnected everybody really is in these bands. Or and a level be. of respect, for yeah. sure. Yeah. But there was someone who knows what I'm like as an interviewer <laughs> pretty intimately. <laughs> and she believed me and was willing to talk about her perspective. And that was Jen Champion, who's one of the co-founders of Chris is Weird, who's also in the band Jen Champion, formerly known as S, uh, and she's my wife. Well, let's hear from her then. All right, get ready. Uh, and one thing, there is 
a lot of talk about addiction in this episode and some pretty intense uh, conversation around mental health stuff. So if you as a listener don't feel like you're ready for that right now, then skip this one because it gets pretty heavy. But if, if you feel like you're open to it, I think there's a lot of really good stuff in this one. Let's talk about this band you were in. My old band? Yeah, what was your old band called? Chris is weird. How old were you when you formed that band i guess probably about 17 17 17 i didn't yeah. know you were that young <laughs> yeah, i was a teenager How did it start? Um, Matt Brooke, who's the other mem- like other main stay, the other co-founder. Co-founder. That's a good, better word for it. <laughs> um, we were just friends and as teenagers, in the like goth teenagers in Tucson. Well, I probably like intellectually goth, but I don't think we necessarily dressed very goth. Maybe a little bit. The desert guy. I mean, I definitely wore a lot of black and had some Robert Smith hair. Yeah, Matt played music. I never thought about being in a band. And he was like, you should play. We should put his music together. And I thought he was a pretty good musician. (laughs) So we just started playing together and it was like, I guess we're in a band now. When did you start having people show up to your shows? I must have been 21 or so. So like in the span of like being a band since you were 17 and being 21, it's forever. But, you know, in actuality, like moving to Seattle and then getting, being able to get shows and play with, you know, bands like, you know, it was like Love is Laughter and Murder City Devils at the time. Mark Lanigan. You played with Mark Lanigan? Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, (laughs) that's my memory. Who knows if it's real? (laughs) Why do you doubt your memory? You know, science has talked about... Jennifer. (laughs) (laughs) Why do you doubt your memory? I was drinking a lot. (laughs) And science. people reacting to you I mean I feel like people would get really into it I mean I guess I want to say we had like really loyal fans yeah I mean it's hard to explain I think it just seemed like maybe we were doing something different or we were very quiet and had violin and piano and it was very orchestrated Maybe there was just like an intense vulnerability to it that attracted people who were intense and vulnerable as well.
and then you break up the band. I would say, you know, band breakups are complex. You know, it's like being in a relationship with a bunch of people. I was, I'm going to say I was the catalyst for the breakup, but okay. there was probably a lot going on. What happened? What was your part? Um, I mean, in short, I was like in the middle of a tour. I was like, I don't want to tour anymore. I'm done doing this. Okay, so in long, <laughs> in long, we we had just been on a few really long tours, and I was really dealing with some depression, and it was to the point where like it had just gotten like really painful. Like sometimes depression, I feel like is like don't care about anything, but then sometimes it can be like just pain, and I was just drinking so much to kind of deal with that I had like air, these little airplane bottles I would buy at the liquor store and sometimes I'd put them in my socks and drink them at the rest of them and take them into the bathroom which I don't think anybody knew at the time because we did have a rule of no drinking in the van like you weren't allowed to drink in the van because if the driver couldn't drink, no one could drink, you know? So you're drinking a lot, you're very depressed. Are you talking to anyone ab about how you feel? I mean, not in a, like, I, I think people knew. I think I'm so, I was surrounded by people who were depressed as well. And, and that's me maybe projecting or whatever, but, you know, you know, I think because of like Chris's weird content and the style of our band, it, you know, it just kind of went with, I think, the image of sad, depressed, you know, too much alcohol. thinking if I left the band I would feel better like something about being on tour was just so hard and me drinking at the time was getting really to this point where like I think I felt more like playing a show was like getting in the way of me wanting to get really drunk because I could you know, I had to have some level of coherentness to be able to play the show. And at some point, I really was like, oh, I don't want to. I was just feeling really backwards. And so I, my solution was like, if I'm out of the band, I don't have to worry about any of this anymore. We had scooped around to the East Coast, and I think we were in Baltimore. We had had this horrible drive. And I got out of the van and I was like, I kind of can't remember what I said. I was just like, I'm not doing this anymore or something. Who are you talking to? I mean, I guess everyone in the van. You just turned around and looked it up and you were like, I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah, something like that. Do like, you remember anyone's reaction to you? Everyone ignored me, which I don't know if they <laughs> <laughs> didn't hear me or it was like what is Jen doing you do have a really quiet voice <laughs> I do I do and so it was like maybe a show or two later that I was like I don't want to tour anymore of course that I had had a couple of days to like really rationalize like they could hire a guitar player to go on tour like this seems fine I just won't tour I'll stay in Seattle and I'll write music still but I, I don't want to be on tour so your intention at that point wasn't to quit the band it was just to not tour anymore 
Yeah, because touring was getting in the way of you drinking, and drinking was how you were dealing with your depression. Yeah, I mean, I th- I, f- I feel like so. Maybe that wasn't like super clear at the time. It wasn't not like, clear at the back. time. <laughs> <laughs> not clear at the time. So what did? So what happened then? Me and Matt sat down and talked about it. I mean, I feel like people were pretty upset. It was silly to think we could do Carissa's weird not me with not me because it had been me and Matt for so long. did feel like a lot of guilt because I think Matt did have to deal with a lot of fallout from you know and I just didn't have the capacity to care about anybody else in the band either at the time I couldn't talk to anybody about it because I think everyone was pretty upset with me I think it was clear that I was having a lot of problems When you say you were having a lot of problems, like you were drinking a crazy amount and your health was pretty terrible. Go into it as much as you're willing to. You know, I think it's hard to deal with like being devastated by something while also not caring about it or like feeling like that's your thought about it. Like, I don't care about this at all. Then not having any structure of being in this band anymore allowing me to kind of just plummet into this kind of I can drink as much as I want you know I was really struggling with an eating disorder you know I think it was like for me like any second I didn't have to deal with reality that's what was I was doing and if I couldn't be drinking I was doing something with eating or not eating or whatever and you know just something to like kind of control what I was feeling at the time because I don't think I was able to get a hold of how sad I was. When did you realize that drinking was something that you couldn't do anymore? (laughs) Maybe a couple years later that a couple years? <laughs> yeah. I, I did not realize that. So after the after Chris's Weird broke up, you drank like that for a couple more years? Well, yeah. And the thing was, after Chris's Weird broke up, I decided to make a solo record, which absolutely pissed off Chris's Weird. <laughs> you know, and I think I thought I would have like, well, I'm going to make this solo record and... I'm not going to tour, which is not exactly an option, you know, although like that was on Suicide Squeeze and David and I came to an agreement about that I didn't want to tour and I did, I did end up flying around and playing some shows, but you did. Oh, you jerk. I know it was a real (laughs) jerk. My plan wasn't to like be in a, have a successful solo project, you know, was like, I'm going to make this record, and then I'm probably going to die. Talk to me about going to the doctor. Um, well, that was probably what scared me as I went to the doctor because my insides were hurting. You know, it's like there with my emotional pain, but it's definitely like my body hurts. My inside, there's something wrong on there. I'm like absolutely sure I'm got cancer. I am sure that like something has is killing every major organ that I have. But you know, which probably is just emotional feelings and drinking and drinking I went so when I go to the doctor she's like you can't 
and drink anymore. Um, my liver is so swollen that it's like, you can, you know, and I'm really skinny at the time. You can kind of see it. My liver pouring out under my ribs. You know, it was just like a pretty frightening physical picture to where like there's really something wrong here. In fact, there are very few pictures of you from this time, right? Yeah, I refused to have my picture taken at the time. You know, like how image based, you know, music can be sometimes. It's so- So the doctor says, you can't drink anymore. Well, she was like, if you keep drinking like this, you're going to die. How long did she give you? I, maybe a year. So how long after the doctor told you that if you kept drinking like this, you would die? Did you keep <laughs> drinking? I mean, it was probably about a year. Maybe a little she less. She was like, you have a year. And you're <laughs> like, I'll take it. <laughs> Do you think that, I mean, I, I know that we are laughing about it but obviously it's very serious were you drinking to try to die yeah i would say that's fair i mean it feels like such an intimate thing to talk about in a interview but it's also something that it's like i think is i wish more people would talk about you know because i think especially so many people deal with depression and you know, feeling suicidal and, you know, maybe if it was, people would be like, me too, and now I don't feel that way. Yeah, so let's get there. (laughs) Because this is some dark shit. (laughs) So, how the fuck did you stop then? How did you stop drinking? I get a call that my friend's going to rehab. And I am shocked because I bo- I thought we'd both die probably and I at least wanted to die first and the rehab was not in the equation and I was like what right you felt like you kind of had a partner in this yeah and then and then all of a sudden you're just alone drinking to die yeah that was probably the worst and then my mom had kind of put out you know I think that she was really having a hard time you know, I think thinking that I was going to die. God, your poor mom. Yeah, my poor mom. You know, and luckily at the time she we were living in separate places, so she didn't really have to see me, which I think was probably helpful, but she would always just kind of put out there that, like, if I ever wanted help, she was like, I will help. You just got to let me know. Maybe I was just, like, more scared of dying than I thought and was like, if this rehab situation doesn't work, I can totally still kill myself. You know, like that was my thought. And then I was like, celebrities go to rehab. I mean, maybe it'll be kind of cool. <laughs> I honestly think that like the fact that celebrities go to rehab was like the push for me. you know, like a 30 day program. And then right before that was over, the program directors were like, Jen, you know, you're doing really well, but we think you should go to this other 90 day program. And I was like, what? I'm like, but I'm doing great. I love it. I'm sober. It's awesome. Why do I need to go to another program? But I think Kind of like it being the first time in my life where I was like, I should really listen to what other people are saying. And then I'm out of my 90 days and I'm like, yes, I'm going back to Seattle. And maybe it's like I'm two weeks out, I'm ending my 90 day program. And they're like, Jen, you know, a sober living is a really good option for you. And I was like, what? <laughs> I've been here for four months. I did um, reluctantly go to sober living. And then I moved back in with my mom. How long did you live with your mom before you eventually got back to Seattle? Well, probably just like a couple months. That was enough, though. 
<laughs> even though like she was so nice to me your mom's wonderful yeah she was a real I, you know I'd probably be dead if it wasn't for her Like you're gone for a year. Did you have it in your mind anywhere that you were going to play music with Matt and Ben again when you got back? Was Carissa's Weird ever an option? It was not for me. I, I don't think explicitly, but I remember I had been talking with Matt on the phone sometimes um, from rehabs or whatever. And but this is right at the time when like Band of Horses is exploding. And at this point, Matt and Ben were both in Band of Horses. Yeah, and I don't really understand what's going on. I'm in rehab. I'm like, I've been gone, you know, and I remember, you know, it wasn't very long after I got back, Band of Horses was playing, and I go to the show, and it's literally like a line wrapped around Numos, and I'm like, what? You know, and I've been gone, so I have no idea that, like, they've become so popular. And I'm like, what's happening? <laughs> Did you think, maybe this is a naive question to ask, because I've never been in like an actual band, but when you got back, was there ever a thought in your mind that you would just join Band of Horses? You know, I don't know. I don't remember, but I do, I did feel like very disconnected, you know, like whatever damage I had done, I think as proud of me as they were and as much as they love me it was there had been some damage and you know you know even before I went to rehab we hadn't really been hanging out or doing anything together you know so there was like distance there that wasn't there before but I couldn't remember being there before because I wasn't very coherent did you feel left behind oh yeah like, that, it was very hard to deal with, like, you know, we had been doing Curses Weird for so long, and then it was almost, it was like they were instantly famous to me. Like, instantly, like, success, giant tours, and I was like, oh. You know, just, you know, they're doing David Letterman, and I am like, what is happening, you know? And I think feeling, like, so, so happy for them because I did feel like so guilty about Carissa's weird breaking up that I was like, this came out of it. You know, like you, you have all this success and you, I don't think this would have happened to Carissa's weird. I mean, I think we would have been popular, but not in that same explosion kind of way. Why do you think that is? Eh, we were just too weird and too dark, you know? Do you ever regret the fact that you quit Chris is Weird? I do sometimes. I think I wish it would have gone a different way. What way? Like, I guess that instead of, I guess, feeling like, I, I maybe I felt like I had a little too much power in that situation where I was like, I'm done. And everyone's like, okay, granted, I think there was probably other things going on in the band at the time that made that band end. Because I think if I would have been able to get help at that time, you know, it could have been a, maybe been a different story. Like rather than breaking up, that you would have just taken a break and gone to rehab? Yeah, if like, you know, not that, rehab was not just never on my radar. It wasn't like I don't want until your friend went. Yeah, it wasn't like I don't want to go. I don't want to do that. It just like getting help just wasn't something I, which wasn't on my radar. Yeah. It wasn't like sometimes it's really hard to see you have a problem. <laughs> you know. Do you remember the first time you played a show sober? I do. How was that? That sounds like it would be terrifying. It was, and it wasn't. I think I was 
really proud of myself. And I had such a good time. You did? Yeah, I think... I think it was like, oh, I really like doing this when before I had hated playing live so much. But I think I was because I was so self-conscious and so had so much anxiety and like hated anybody looking at me, you know, like all of those feelings. And like from like getting a lot of help, I had been like, oh, I really like doing this. And like, what a cool thing that people are here and that I get to be on stage and I have playing with such great musicians. It was just like a different way to look at things. How long has it been um, since you got sober? It's been almost 12 years. Holy shit. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> What do you want from playing music now? I was just talking to someone about this the other day. About, I think, just being like, I just want to do this. Whatever, however I can play music and try and make some money and live. Like, that's what I want to do. If I could just see you straight, I'd probably head straight for the door. I don't want to take for granted Jen's candor in this interview because although she has albums like Ugly But Honest, it's not easy. Just because you have the words doesn't mean it's easy to share that kind of stuff. Just because you know what it felt like and um, you're willing to have a conversation like that with your wife doesn't mean that you're automatically willing to share that with everyone. So, I mean, the fact that Jen was able to speak so like eloquently on that and just like really open up, I'm so... I really appreciate. I feel like it's important, if you can, to be able to share those kinds of stories. You know, as someone who has struggled with drinking too much or being too sad at yeah. different points, like having, just hearing someone else talk about how much work it can be, yes, can be so helpful. Especially how that stuff can get glossed over, like, and then I went away and now I don't drink and this is all, you know, we had a break up. Like it can just get glossed over and quickly recapped as like a, you know, so that's how that went. Yeah. When the reality is like it's it is it's a lot of work and you know stuff that can seem really obvious in hindsight when you're in the moment of it, you can't see it for sure. what it is. And feeling like you're worth the effort mm -hmm. to put in that kind of work to get yourself help and get sober and whatever can be really really difficult to to put together in your brain. It can be so hard. And you know, I I let Jen hear this edit before we put it out because I wanted to make sure she felt good about it because right. it is so intimate. And she said that it was kind of hard to listen to her tell this story, but that she was glad because it needs to be told more often. People need to talk about like the work that goes into getting help, being happy, being sober and staying sober right. and that it also can feel really awesome and that you can feel even better 12 years on right than you ever expected to feel yep and that also with bands just like we mentioned about how a breakup can feel like your family secrets mm -hmm. or that it's all so interconnected it brings up all the complicated emotions in life of like being really genuinely happy for your friends and feeling left out or kind of like what's happening all at the same time yeah. because it's just it's it's not just a one feeling kind of experience. No, we're gonna have resources if you or someone you know is dealing with addiction stuff, we're gonna have resources on the website, we're gonna have some mental health hotline stuff up there, and we'll have some links to Music Cares, which is a program who 
can help you, a program that can help you if you are someone who plays music. Um, they can help you with everything All from like stuff. dental insurance to like getting you into addiction, a lot of things. And that actually... Getting you into addiction help. Yeah, not into addiction. <laughs> getting you out of addiction. Getting you help if you're addicted to right. something. Big thanks to Jen Champion. I love you. Thank you so much. And also thank you to the bosses here at Sub Pop for, you know helping make this podcast possible. Mm-hmm. That would be Chris Jacobs, Megan Jasper, and Jonathan Poneman. Um, we would like to invite you to join us on Facebook. Sub Pop Podcast. You can find us on Facebook. We'll put some Chris's weird videos up there if you have a story that you want to share about yeah. seeing them. We want to yeah. hear those stories. I do know that at least, at least two people I know moved to Seattle because of Chris's weird shows that they went to. Wow. Yeah. I believe it. People were into them, man. <laughs> Uh, all the music we used in the episode today was from Chris is Weird. You can find more information about all these things in our show notes at subpop.fm. Mm-hmm. And music at Hardly Arts Mini Mart, Sub Pop's Mega Mart. Yeah. We didn't put a commercial in this episode because oh, that would yeah. have been in poor taste. Yeah. <laughs> we'll hear more from Jen after this ad. Yeah. Let me sell you a crop top from Sub Pop. <laughs> Anything I, else? Um, I feel like that's more than enough out of me definitely more than enough out of me <laughs> thank you bye, bye. You gotta get your foot in the door. You can't just like, you know, like top lining house music. No, I don't know. What does that, that mean? You know, like right in the, you got do, 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 some house and you got some. No, 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 dance all night. No, no. I thought house was like. Is that house? Yeah. And then you put a like a sing, like a little singing line on top of it. So if I'm doing like. You do a top line. You know. So that's a top line. That's my best understanding of a top line. I just fake it. <laughs>